graffiti to me is a very, very complicated issue. And uh, I don't know where to begin with that. Graffiti is like all American. I mean, it's about, your, it's about fame and about being popular. It's, it's something that can't be tamed. It's wild and it's free in the, in the very essence of the word freedom. Graffiti is Americana. A writer is sometimes a piecer. He is the, doing large masterpieces, doing illustrations, murals, doing pieces out into the street, the large illustrations. Writers have something to say. That's why they call themselves writers. A tagger is just somebody who wants to get their name up. It's just about getting their own recognition. It's just getting recognized by their own crew. Going Bali is, it's kind of like, it's kind of adventurous, I guess, you know? Going, it's like you're going on a mission, like to get spots and getting away with it. And like, sometimes you'll be climbing stuff. It's like, whoa, if I fall, I'll die. And you know, but it's, it's, it gives you a rush. It feels good. <laughs> For the people who don't understand how tagging and graffiti goes hand in hand, what it was, it's just like a, a progress. When you first got into it, or at least when I first got into it, you did a lot of tagging to get your name out there, notoriety amongst your friends. After that, you went in and started making your name a little bit more fancier because you wanted your name to stand out a little bit more, so you started getting these bubble-shaped letters just to make it a little bit more, and that's evolving. From then, you start working with your color and going on and characters. It just goes step by step. Tagging, to be called the tagger, just limits what I am. I'm an artist. Graffiti was the only form of art that, that said something to me. It said something back to me. It got me excited. When I looked at a piece, I could feel it. I could feel it in my hands. I feel it in my blood. I get excited looking at a piece, a good piece. And it just, I guess, basically it let me know, know I was alive because I could feel myself. Whereas other art, it was nice to look at, but it didn't do anything for me. At the time, when I embraced hip-hop and graffiti art, I was very, very, very conservative, really conservative. <laughs> it just took over my mind. That's the only way I can put it. You know, I had a extended family, a whole crew, you know, and now all of a sudden you become popular. I want everybody to know who I am, you know? I don't want to be just another face in the crowd, you know? If, if I'm going to be somebody, I want people to feel like, oh, nerve, yeah, I know who he is. I want people to know who I am. I don't want to just go through life just being, you know, not, not restricting myself to friends, restricting myself to my neighborhood. I want to be everywhere. Most kids don't have money to go to art school and figure out how they're going to paint and, and, and do these campuses, so they figure we'll just pick up a spray can and do it on, on, on our campus, which is a city, you know? So it's all about free expression, you know? It's like, it's like I don't need money or I don't need, I don't need you, know, the, the, you know, the man up there or whoever to tell me how to do my stuff, you know? I'm just going to... This, I'm just going to do it from here, and, and you don't like it, it's too bad. You know? I guess you could call me the authentic graffiti writer, because I will write on any surface, you know. I'm from tattooing to, to this, you know. As the saying goes, you got to do your part to combat the conspiracy, you know, and this is my part, I paint. I think graffiti has, has allowed me to evolve in this manner of, like, actually viewing life and, and being more uh, sensitive to certain, to certain things going around. In, in my environment because of, of, of like certain cliches like you are a product of your environment. And that's true to a point because the environment that you grow up in becomes part of you and you become part of it, but to a point because as soon as you reach that point, you know. Because everyone feels like someone's trying to control them. Everywhere you turn, something's being taken away from you now, something, something else is being increased upon you. The restrictions are getting tighter. It's like, damn, the fucking smog is enough to kill you. Now we got everything else. And graffiti is a, a loud, colorful voice. And it's a good way of putting a message across. People see it. You don't do it for anyone else. You're doing it for yourself, the personal satisfaction of doing it. To know you were there, you did it. Um, it's all about you and what you can do, how far you can take it, how far you can take your cans. It's just. To me, it was 100% my thing, and I was the only one that mattered and my crew. Two and three is like the story of LA, you know, the story of what um, people go through in LA nowadays. You know, this is the, the mid-90s, you know, 
And um, there's been a lot of gang warfare and um, a lot of police brutality, a lot of pollution, a lot of hypocrisy in LA, a lot of crime, a lot of um, injustice has been going on, you know? And uh, 213 speaks about that, you know? Like um, with our artwork, um, a lot of times it's different from a lot of other graffiti artists in the sense that a lot of graffiti artists will talk about the issues going on right in their work. They'll put paragraphs talking about what's going on or they'll, they'll depict what's going on like at face value. But our stuff is more subliminal, you know. It's, it's, it's like more in the line. You gotta, you gotta come from that perspective to really understand the lines and what we're trying to say inside those lines, you know. Our inspiration, a lot of it had to do with the gang writing. So a lot of gang names, you know, certain people in, in different gangs, you know, came up with their own styles of writing. Be it, you know, it was a gang form, but I mean, that was a major influence, just all the old English letters, calligraphy letters, tattoos. Old school is an earlier style that started before hip hop, because here on the West Coast, here in Los Angeles, we already had a tradition of uh, graffiti. We had the, the tradition of graffiti from the, uh, from the cholos, from the pachucos, from the, it was a, from the Latin community. So all the way since probably the 30s and the 40s, they used to do uh, their graffiti. It was before even the use of spray cans. It was done with a brush. And it was a delineation of your territory and of your crew and of your uh, community. So it was an old school in that it, it was a pride in the community. You wrote for your, your, your group. And it was um, called a gang. But it wasn't gangs of what we have uh, today. It was gangs of more of a club, more of an identity. Those symbols of those times, which is half English, half Spanish, certain symbols that are, it's always in the German Gothic typeface. So there's a tradition in that old school. And it was always done with black and white. That was before hip hop. Hip hop is different. So I'm from that old school LA gang style from graffiti from my generation, which was the uh, 1950s and 1960s. Around 84, me and uh, a buddy of mine, Pedro, PJ, he, uh, we hooked up, and some of his friends that were more into hip hop and break dancing, and I would also try my, uh, try my goes at break dancing, never was good at it. But yeah, Pedro and me and this other kid, rival, Nathan, uh, we all hooked up as ism, and uh, we were just uh, tagging around and doing stuff, and we all of a sudden came up with this name, uh, West Coast Artist. And we were like, yeah, that sounds good. And, and then from there, we just started with that, and we kept it. Well, we started on Olympic, coming home on Fridays from Fairfax. We started the writer's bench on the West Coast at, <laughs> ironically, at Carl's Jr. at Carl Karcher. Um, right there on the corner at the bus stop. And it started off as just WCA. Mainly our crew would meet there on Fridays. We would hang out after school and look at each other's black books, maybe catch a few tags on the bus bench or uh, the bus is passing. But it grew to be such a thing where kids would start ditching school on Friday just to take the bus from like Pasadena or like Riverside just to come out to the writer's bench and maybe get Minor to tag their book or get a, you know, Design 9 to, you know, do a throw up on the back of their book or whatever. You know, it, it became a, we became instant celebrities. You know, I wrote my name like everybody else, but I started getting more into, like, um, styles, you know, and what I wanted to say, you know, within, like, you know, what I wrote. Because, like, I would write my name and everything. And it was cool, but I got sort of burned out rather quickly. So I started writing, like, little sayings behind my names instead of writing, like, like yeah, I wrote crews and stuff, but always a little quick saying, like, three, four, five words, you know. Like, I would write, like, my name Design 9, and I'd be like, none cooler, none finer. You know, stuff like that. Before I started getting really active, 85, 86, when it started really you know, those initial years of L.A. graffiti when people were producing and coming up with styles, it was the east side was like all the people that grew up in the gangs, the old English, the blockbusters, you know, the gang writing. So like a lot of those, that type style lettering kind of evolved into the graffiti. Whereas 
where we saw that point of view, like the West Side writers, they evolved from the New York influence more so. So their work resembled New York or a particular writer at the time named Soon. We always kind of said that. And I guess if you talk to some of the West Coast artists, like they know in a sense that their style, they, it, the styles were just totally different. It was, it was the West, West Side style and the East Side style. We were the East Side style. We were the ones, I mean, in my point of view, we were the original as far as like the way that we presented our graffiti, the way the colors, the letters, not to put down, down anything on them, but we were the ghetto kids and they were the rich kids. They were the ones that like, that had cars, that had like, you know, a nice home and stuff like that. Yeah, and the money. So, and you know, we just had each other. Well, it's a character that I, that I came up with. It's like a, a, a chicken and uh, with an afro. It's like kind of symbolizing, a, a, I guess, a, a funky chicken George, if you want to call it that. But uh, I just, um, I came up with this character, and then I did it once, and I liked it, and, and it was in a place where I couldn't take it with me, so I decided to do it again. And this is like, I'm still working on it, still in progress right now. When I say Chicken George, don't necessarily have to mean like, like the slave, you know, back on Roots, from Roots. It's just like a, uh, just like maybe a character in, my, in the neighborhoods I grew up with, you know, like a, a, a kind of skinny, lanky brother that's, you know, in the hood, kind of funky brother that, I just decided to bring to life, you know, on the canvas. He just kind of looks kind of crazy, like one eye, like you have one eye is real bugged out, like he's kind of checking you out, and the other eye is kind of, like it's not finished yet, but it's kind of jacked up, I guess maybe he got put, out, like he got messed up or something sometime in his life, and like his eye, other eye is gone, so I just put the yellow spot there. Well, pretty much it's just um, a bunch of people have a bunch of different tastes. So what I might like, somebody else might not like, you know? So it, it all depends from, from the person. It depends on the, on the person that sees it. Like, I may like some stuff, and my homeboy might say, yeah, that's like cool, whatever, but I might really like it, you know? And my, my homeboy's been working on a style, on a wild, different type of wild style, where uh, you can't really see the letters. For us, you know, that, that's wild style, and then we might look at somebody else's wild style, and that might not be, you know, so wild for us. And then, but somebody else that doesn't know our style might think, you know, that's, you know, hectic. I wouldn't be able to stop um, piecing or drawing or anything like that. Because once you get into it, it's, I, I guess you could say it's kind of like, it gets to be like a ritual. You know what I mean? Just piecing and piecing every week, trying to like come up with more ideas, more styles, trying to stay ahead and trying to make it look cool, get can control and all that. I think uh, can control really, to me, it comes down to being able to manipulate the can for you to stop your motion when you want to stop it and not go over it and get a sharp, crisp, straight underline, the word straight line. I mean, that's what can control is to me. Newer generations, to really practice and get an appreciation of and further their own letter styles to come up with new styles. It's like I said, an S, you know, how much of a variation can you get from an S? It's just a curly sign. That's where the creativity comes. I mean, that's what I think graffiti is all about, about going to a wall and freestyling a letter. And it's, you know, it's an S, but hey, it doesn't look like your typical generic S. How do you know that it's an S, though? Because you've seen other letters that look like that, or approximate it, are not exactly this one, but they approximate it, and therefore your visual language has grown. Your vocabulary of what you've seen, you could tie it into that and associate that with an S. The more you've seen, the more off-the-wall styles you've seen, the better you're at. We groove off each other's vibes, you know. I, I see it a lot like, um, like jazz, like when different musicians come together, Dizzy Gillespie or, or John Coltrane playing with Miles Davis, they feed off each other in a certain type of communication that outsiders can't really understand. Fans of jazz can understand jazz to a certain extent, but never as deep as the artists who are communicating with each other through that, that form of sound. I think in the same way graffiti is like that. Graffiti is very communal. Graffiti is very uh, interactive. And um, artists feed off each other's work, you know? This guy here. Man, he has some pretty um, crazy style of um, 
of um, feelings. You know, he goes for like different, more of um, like like action. Like you can see his stuff is like action, like moving and stuff. It's pretty. It's pretty good. Like he throws in like a lot of cuts, a lot of little nicks. He does a lot of nicks. See, so like it's like like it's like an action, but like kind of exploding. It's pretty weird. And he has all these rugged cuts in here, you know? And he has like these, you got like all this like symmetrical like cuts and stuff. So he's pretty good. And this is like his own style. His own style. I don't know what, he, what kind of style he calls it, but it's more like a, it's kind of like a, uh, like patterns or something, like patterns and stuck of each other, right? As dimensions and stuff. That was more of a technical thing for me. Um, I had those letters and I don't get to paint with Gypsy very often. And so I went and I painted those letters just for the hell of it, basically. It wasn't actually the way I turned, wanted it to turn out, but it worked out. Um, the actual painting for me and a lot of the actual going out and doing graffiti is more of a performance art for me. And it, it's more of like, it's more of a physical thing than like a mental thing when I'm doing it. So the mental part of it kind of stays at home when I'm um, you're talking about the philosophy of what I do. Um, I think that stays, that's the original idea. And then when I go to the street, you know, I'm busy doing my thing, you know, watching out for whatever I have to watch out for. We, we not only have to worry about just the regular ignorant people, but we got the super ignorant, which are the gangsters. that are always trying to come up on us because they see us stealing the spotlight from them. It's not People don't talk about them as much anymore. They talk about us more, and they don't like that. So I, that's how I see it. So every day I think about really surviving. It's, more, it's a game of survival, and I get through doing what I have to do. And if I do it, then that's a good day for me. Uh, as an early writer, I guess one of my main influences I, would be my friend Prime. Um, a long time friend, me and him hung out like over 10 years. Um, there were summers where like we spent like every day, spent the night, you know, we'd, all day long just hanging out with him, like just either drawing and just those early stages as a kid being like 15, 14, 15, and just like sketching and drawing and just constantly, constantly. And I guess one of the saddest things is, you know, as growing up, we had an experience one, one time where, where, where um, we were shot at and he got shot. I was approached by a few, few kids carrying some guns and they asked us where, you know, where we were from, me and another friend of mine, Javier. And, we, you know, we let them know, this is where we stand and they lit us up like, like ducks, and, <laughs> you know, in a, in a pond. Just, just shot us up with shotguns and 45s and kicked us and until they ran out of bullets and left us there, like, like run over dogs or something. Kicked me into another world, you know. It was like it was so. I thought it would, if I ever became close to a death, I thought it was gonna happen quick, you know. But it, it happened so much of a, like a, 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 a like minute, you know. Of terror, you know, of, of fighting with the gun and, and struggling so I wouldn't get like my head blown off and covering and 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 dropping and rolling and the person's kicking me and 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 it was like wow, you know, I I didn't I, it uh and then my arm, you know, and like my arm was like totally just like shattered, you know, like, whole muscle was taken off the the tendons and the veins were like like in a movie, you know, like everywhere. And um, so my arm got reconstructed again, and you know, thank uh, some God, you know, that uh, that I'm here and that I was able to survive it. Oh, 
See, a lot of people, when you say hip-hop culture, well, okay, it's just like the hippie days. The hippie, rock music included a lot of things, folk music, protest music, psychedelic music, acid music. Well, hip-hop culture in, in, in encompassed the whole thing of the music, the dance, the emceeing, the clothes, and the art. Well, hip-hop originated as a musical. It was originally music art and dance. It's, it came from New York. It came out of the disco era. It's taken up on a lot of things that have in the past, jazz, reggae. It's all involved in hip hop. Today, it's a little bit different because it's, they separated in saying that hip hop is just rap music. They limit it as it's one aspect. And that's because of the industry in large. They, they came in and they decided, well, we figure it's hip hop and what it's not. But in the whole, it's, it still consists of our art, our dance, and our music. So in whole, hip hop is a culture in a way. Breaking was something that society didn't know about. It was something too new for them to even understand. And because of their ignorance to it and lack of knowledge about it, they got scared. And the first thing they do when they get scared about something is to try and stop it. So when, when breaking was around, that dance sort of scared them. They stopped, they stopped everybody from breaking in the malls, breaking on the streets. And so a lot of, a lot of breakers turned their, their energies into graffiti. So then graffiti started coming up, and all of a sudden, this is another thing that they see that they're scared of. It's new. They don't know anything about it. So, so what are they to do then? Is to try and stop it also. Rather than to understand the problem and see why the kids are doing it, they sit there and try and stop it, not knowing that that the thing that fuels this, this kind of movement is the energy that the kids have. Now, with society not giving the kids a different, a different way or a different form to express their energies and them just taking something away, their energies are going to go into something else. It, it, at, with graffiti, it's a positive energy that these kids are doing. They're putting their efforts into something beautiful to make something look nice. Now, with the city taking it away from us, and taking away our yards and not allowing us to do what we want to do, they're sort of like stopping a lot of kids from taking that energy and making it positive. And these kids are turning their energy into something negative. So they're starting to go out there gang banging because they can't kick back at the yards no more. As far as the young generation of people who's trying to get involved, I feel that maybe they might be missing out on a lot of different things that we had in our time as we was coming up. For instance, for instance, I had a mentor that helped me, that taught me how to do graffiti. You know, they they showed me you know, how to put my things together and how to, you know, they took me to different yards, you know, they trying to introduce me to different things and I feel that that was, you know, benefiting into my life because it helped me and also other people that I hung around with, they were doing a lot of things for like, uh, for instance, like maybe they painted storefronts and they was getting paid and I was like, well, maybe I should try some of that. I could use my art and get paid for it. And then on the other hand, I could just do it, like I said, for my own self-satisfaction, you know. I was born with the talent, I guess. My mom's been an artist and everyone, so it was naturally in me to draw and just be creative. And uh, being creative wasn't enough for me. I wanted to get into some trouble. I wanted to see some action. I wanted to express myself, but not in such a boring way, I guess. I don't know. I told my, uh, my teacher when I was a little kid, she asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I told her I wanted to be a terrorist or an artist, so something, something like that. It goes back to when, whenever I'm doing my things, I, I try to think of uh, all the BS we have to go through for just a lot of times I think about all the, the crap we have to go through just because my skin is brown and stuff like that. You know, I, I get anger in my head and sometimes I'll, I'll let that show on the wall. I'll let it show with like some fierce lettering or something or a, a, a fierce comment. Like I'll put something, you know, watch out, the aliens are coming. And right away, people see that, and, and you know, they'll have something to say about it because they see me doing it, and they're like, oh, what's he trying to say? So they get afraid because they see some knowledge in there, and they see that it's, 
in their eyes, some like ghetto youth. So they're like, oh, you know, what, what are these kids up to? Whatever. 200 years from now, you know, we'll be in all the books. I mean, not even, I mean, even 50 years from now, we'll be in the books and we'll be, you know, giving lectures and teaching kids about graffiti and stuff, you know? But in 200 years from now, we'll be like, you know, you know, just like Van Gogh, you know, selling those paintings for, you know, millions of dollars and stuff, you know, after, <laughs> you know, like just because I, I just think, you know, especially like graffiti artists are really misunderstood and we're kind of like trying to tell people about something that's going on that, that they're just neglecting, especially in L.A. It's like such a fake city, you know, it's like, like we're, we're, we're just fine and, and there's no problems, you know, but then you go on the freeway and then you see these signs with like, you know, barbed wire wrapped around fences so, so that kids don't jump over the fences and then you see, you know, um, homeless people on the streets and then you see, you know, people selling oranges and it's like, and, and, and still you ask people in L.A. and they're like, no, we're doing great, this is a perfect city, it's like, you know, it's like this big, you know, uh, it's like, you know, t talking about pulling, up, pulling the wool over your eyes, you know, that's, that's kind of how I see L.A. people, you know, they just don't know what's going on. A lot of time it's, it's telling people what the state of, uh, you know, what the situation is going on in their town or whatever. I mean, I always say that, you know, you want to find out about a city, read the writing on the walls. It's not even a consideration to try to even say, should we consider graffiti art? It's, that's ridiculous. I mean, if you think, I mean, in the sense of like art movements of the past, there were certain movements where people totally rejected. Like, they were la like, this is a joke. This is an art. You know, what's this, you know, all about? If you're going to like, to like bring all the way back to like Favism, you know, Matisse and then uh, abstract expressionists. There was people always getting down saying, this is, this isn't it. This is just paint splattered or this is just some crazy colors, you know, rude colors, you know. And when I, there's always someone that has a different point of view. Not everybody's going to like what they see, but, you know, it's present. It's there, you know, it's there to see. And it is definitely an art form, definitely. Two pieces, which is done in the old school, mostly black and white, you know. Uh, the first piece is where I wanted to show how graffiti can speak for a person, where I wrote a poem that a friend of mine who's in jail right now uh, sent me. And he's in jail for five years, and he's writing about his lament of being sorry about going to jail and what it feels like in there. And I was so moved that in a lot of ways that this could be spoken in graffiti. It could be spoken in the language that he was raised and what we were raised a language that fits that kind of sorriness or that type of lament, that type of languishing. So I did a painting writing his poem with a dark shadow cast across it, means that he's still in jail, with his incarceration numbers embedded in the concrete of it, and also the word word, W-O-R-D, which in hip hop today means truth, so that was truth. The other painting is called Victims, the skull with the roses in it. There's a uh, we're having too many victims of graffiti. People who, young men who are doing graffiti out there and who are being either killed by vigilantes or who are being uh, uh, unfortunate accidents and all that, this painting is for them. And it's that skull, that smiling skull with the roses in its mouth, it's for them. You know, so it's rest in peace, skate, and rest in peace, Insta. My canvases and, and my other art is entirely different from when I take a spray paint, a spray can and go up against a wall. And, and I think that the reasons that I, I used to paint that I'm having difficulty with now, I think they're, you know, I think it's, it's a time where I have to grow. I have to, I have to either grow and, and find new reasons that are meaningful for me to continue painting, which is what I was talking about, maybe start working in, in more you know, more communication, saying what I want people to know that I think, you know, instead of just painting things that look nice. For me, it's important for me just to know that my art's been seen. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be seen by everybody, but it kind of, when you're a graffiti artist, it almost, for me, it completes the circle. You know, you, you, you get an idea, you, you conceptualize this idea, you draw, you know, whatever, you paint it, you know, I don't want it sitting in my room because, I mean, then all I can do is say, wow, you know, I'm so talented, <laughs> you know, I'm so good. I'm just going to stay in and stay with myself. But, uh, you know, instead, you know, other people can see it and, 
letting them know at least somebody else has seen it and drawing their own opinion from it and their own idea of what it means. Conservatives tend to believe that it's, it's purely a crime, it's pure vandalism, and there's no, it's done out of hate, and there's no self-awareness, there's no intrinsic value to it. And um, liberals, I tend to see that they, they use graffiti for their own personal causes, like, you know, the NEA, the arts funding, and uh, Rodney King, and uh, this, this, and this, and that, which is all fine and good, but I think graffiti is deeper and has more value than being a political tool, you know? Sure, it speaks on the LA riots and what's going on in LA, but that isn't its own validity, you know? Graffiti, regardless of the issues, will stand on its own and keep going through time. And you see it in rich neighborhoods as, as, as well as poor neighborhoods, and obviously the rich kids, you know, aren't always speaking about the inner city because they don't always know about it. That's why it's so intriguing. The people are very eclectic and they're very different, but they have this one thing uniting them, and that is the art form, graffiti, this form of rebellion, this form of, of, of reaching out, speaking out. Um, but as far as identifying the people, you can't do it, and that's why it's so intriguing, that's why it's such a question, and that's why it's such a big deal in society right now. Is that it's all about risking your life, it's all about you know, who's the baddest, who has the guns, and the media is just, media just wants to hide, they just want an interesting story so people can watch. Fox 11, undercover tonight, tag bangers. They tag and they bang, these are taggers. You know, stuff like that, it's a bunch of crap. I mean, the whole tag banging thing, there is no such thing as a tag banger. Those kids thought, grow, grew up, with society putting it in their minds that it's vandalism, it's vandalism, it's vandalism. And now they come out here and they act stupid on TV telling everybody, yeah, it's vandalism, when they don't really know what's up with that. Well, I would tell them to definitely not see it as vandalism. It's not vandalism, it's a beautiful crime. <laughs> it's a beautiful crime. <laughs> you know, whenever I'm out painting, I could be, you know, sad or whatever, and if I'm painting, everything feels good, you know? I feel alive. I feel a life pain. It's just, I could take my, my problems to the wall and just work on it. By the end of the day, when I'm finished, I created something beautiful, you know? It's like sex. <laughs> right now, it's going through that, that phase, that phase. Because um, I actually, me and a few artists, we did paint at a big museum in LA called MOCA, Museum of Tem Contemporary Art. We did, um, we were like the first artists to paint directly on the surface of the, of the, uh, the museum. So it's slowly by slowly, you know, I've done a couple of plays. I've done like two plays. I, you know, we have, a gallery, we have a gallery opened up right now in Melrose. So it's like, people are buying paintings. So it's like, people are recognizing that it, it is an art. It is an art form. The ICU gallery had a, had a lot of big names, good names. Uh, I thought a majority of them were, were uh, really good artists. They all had their own, own style, their own technique, where there was a small little, uh, little canvas little piece of cardboard to, to big six-foot wood frames. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the art in there, if I had the money, I'd go ahead and buy it. I think they're incredible. I think canvas art serves a function. It could bring in an audience of people who don't deal with graffiti in the streets. It brings in collectors, museums, uh, institutions, more gallery people, art directors. It brings in a whole spectrum of people who, who like graffiti but can't understand it, who want to know more about it. That's what the galleries are about. That's what graffiti magazines are about. But I feel that the gallery, if graffiti is a large spectrum, the galleries are just one slice of it. It adds another layer of understanding. It's not the final outcome of graffiti should go into the mainstream and go only into the galleries. There will be graffiti in the streets, graffiti in the galleries, uh, graffiti in magazines, internet, t-shirts. It'll be involved in all aspects of our life. So I feel that the gallery serves a function and we have, should be appreciative that there are people willing to show shows like that. The opera was, was, was kind of brought to my attention just about, uh, it was about maybe two, two weeks ago. And, uh, you know, I got the script and everything and we talked to the guy, uh, Peter Sellers, we had a meeting with them and discussed the, you know, the subject matter and everything and what we'd be, you know, what, what some of the ideas that we might, you know, want to work on and everything. 
And he pretty much gave us a freedom to interpret, you know, what we wanted to about Los Angeles, which, um, you know, was very helpful, you know, and, and, and he, just, he just didn't, I've worked at where I've worked other jobs for people and they were like, you know, they wanted to hire me, you know, because of what I did, but it was like, when, once they hired me, they wanted to tell me how to do what I do, you know, and it, it didn't, you know, it doesn't really work out. They don't get a really uh, good piece of artwork then. They get something that's half theirs and half mine, you know, or a little bit mine and mostly theirs. And uh, this wasn't the case then. And I, I mean, I think this, this, um, this play is going to be, I mean, this opera is going to be really, it's going to really shake up a lot of people. I just contributed on the scene of Armageddon. Um, on the, uh, at the final act of this play, there's a, an earthquake that destroys Los Angeles, and that interested me. Everyone has this, like, insane image in their mind that's been implanted there since they were born about the day that the earth is going to die and people are going to be killed and Jesus is going to rise up and be resurrected and lava is going to blow from the ground and all this insanity. So, uh, and then there's this whole other chaotic insanity going on with the underground people thinking that flying saucers are going to come and save everybody. So, it's like Jesus is above the television the man was stealing his television to get his piece of whatever he believed in. He got killed for it. He dropped it. The TV's on, and you don't know what reality is, whether you're looking at the TV and that's what's going on, or if all the insanity around you is what's going on. And you don't really know what to believe, and that's just the way life is, kind of. It's an opera by Peter Sellers. It's called, um, I, was looking at the, I was looking at the ceiling, and then I saw the sky. It's like an opera about, uh, it's about the Northridge earthquake that happened here in L.A. Like a year ago or whatever. Yeah, no, it was, it was pretty loose. It was like, um, you know, it was up to the artists to come up with whatever they felt represented L.A., you know, literally and, uh, and otherwise, you know. They just said, we just need an L.A. scene, so put your heads together and come up with what you want. It's just like uh, the youth is kind of being, you know, uh, let loose in L.A., you know. There's no, there's no guidance. There's no... Uh, programs, there's like a lot lacking for the youth, you know? So there's like a, a bunch of uh, kids out there who don't, have, who don't know where to go and just are out there like lost, lost little kids in the streets, you know? So I'm doing all these like babies and stuff, uh, <laughs> running down the streets and uh, an angel, devil up in the sky pulling a baby away. So it's kind of like uh, where I feel going on in LA about the destruction of the youth and stuff. Keith Haring. Keith Haring was a, a good artist that I, I admired a lot. Keith Haring. Um, other writers like um, Scene from New York, uh, Motu from Paris. Like, seen artwork like that. Um, Picasso, because he has some really crazy abstract stuff. And a, probably my biggest influence that I think is probably one of the best painters that ever lived is Salvador Dali. Because he was in. He, he reminds me of like a graffiti artist, you know? Yeah, it's realistic, but it's not. You know, he had things melting and twisted, and a lot of artists, graffiti artists, are in that twisted mind, you know? The same kind of mind that he's in. Just like, as well as um, Von Baudet and Mark Baudet, Cheech Wizard, that was probably one of my biggest right there, Cheech Wizard, and all, all of his, his um, comic books and stuff like that. Like the, the old school pioneer artists like uh, African Bambada, uh, he's the founder of the Universal Zulu Nation, and um, Futura, Scene, uh, who else, Crayon, <laughs> my homeboy Picasso, you know, that's the graffiti writer Picasso. <laughs> Uh, the other guy, I think, I think, but, it, but then again, I, I think the, 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 the other artist, Picasso, I think, you know, he's, he's a cool guy too, you know, he was like a Mac, <laughs> but I think Homeboy, you know, if he was still alive, I think he'd be doing graffiti. I really do. Yes, I, I, do, I do think graffiti artists should, um, I'm not going to say study formal art in universities, but I do think that they should educate themselves in speaking, in writing, 
so that people can understand them better. Because a lot of times it's not that people are, you know, ignorant and blind and don't want to see graffiti. It's not that at all. A lot of times the case is that graffiti writers cannot express themselves in their language, which is the important thing. It's like, you know, why are you going to go to, I mean, I've heard it said before, why are you going to go to an institution that the education is Europeanly based and go through that just to convince them that this is a legit form? And it's like, why wouldn't you do that if you do want them, if you do want to convince them that this is a legit, legit form, you know? Behind my shoulder is a, a steel piece of my tag. This is my tag. This is what I was doing in the streets from 69 to about 85. I did about 15 years of my own graffiti into the streets. Um, I would do it European style with a large stencil. I started doing that in 69, uh, uh, and I would take two of us to, to put it out there. And I would do it only in my neighborhood. I'd do it in Highland Park, and I was involved in uh, Hollywood. I had a lot of friends up there, so I would stencil it up there in Hollywood. And uh, that's what represents me. It's a good luck symbol. It's called Senor Suerte, Mr. Luck. It's a gangster style, New York style, super fly hat, big fur collar, and it's fingers crossed with a big smile, and it means a rebirth. If you believe in this symbol, you will live forever. I kind of think it's the happy face of the 90s, you know. So, but that's, that represents me. That's my tag. Now, if this moment in time was happening now, okay, just like the music is now, uh, the dance is now, the graph art is, is, is now. You know, they don't want to study no old masters. They, 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 they don't want to study body form. They want immediate gratification of seeing my idea being made manifest. Already in cyberspace, and they are tagging cyberspace just like they tag uh, 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 on, on people's buildings. Like a hacker, you can hack into systems and tag all across cyberspace. Tagging, I can tag on a classified or I can tag somebody's email. Okay, and in that way, you're making people recognize that you do exist. Okay, on internet I have access to over three million people. Hopefully, in the way in the future, they'll say, yeah, you know, all these people here were a part of a big movement because graffiti is moving up and it is gonna be sooner or later, you're gonna see it in front of every cornflakes box, in front of, instead of Pepsi's gonna change its symbol, it's gonna have some writer doing it for them. Everybody's gonna change and they're gonna start jockeying this and then Years from now, people are going to look at these right here and say these are old ruins, but you know it's going to be like Egyptian writing or something. They're going to know, un they're not going to understand if they don't educate themselves right now to what's going on. It's not just us; this is worldwide. So, from right there, you know, it's like to say, you got to wake up and start seeing what's really going on. Smell the aerosol, because this movement's coming. It's coming hard. Hey, 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 hey.